This video is sponsored by Dragon Shield, your destination for the best sleeves, deck boxes, and accessories in the multiverse. Purchases through the affiliate link below help the channel grow and improve. Within the seething eddies of magic, across the primordial blind eternities, there exists a plane of luster and brilliance. A strange world, artificial in nature but not devoid of life. Intelligently designed for immaculate mathematical perfection, while at the same time host to creatures or creations born of spontaneity. Cold and calculating, this realm yet stokes the fiery passions of ingenuity. It's a world of metal and flesh, a world of opposite ideals that magnetically attract another, intertwined and harmoniously balanced, to produce a whole more beautiful than its conflicting components. This is a plane weathered by time, shaped by great forces, witness to both glimmers of hope and dark atrocities, a place currently gripped by the corrupting hands of new Phyrexia, its luster tarnished, a pawn in their vile multiversal machinations. Welcome to Mirrodin. The plain of Mirrodin is a treasure trove of artifice most distinguishable by its glimmering metallic surface that shatters luminous rays reflected from five suns that trace celestial paths across the sky. It's a plane that evokes a sense of possibility, a blank canvas of malleable ore easily shaped by desire. It's also a plane of artifice given life and metal made flesh. Mirrodin is unique in the blending of natural with artificial. A traveler might venture through a dense forest made entirely of steel coils that is nevertheless a living, breathing ecosystem. Upon close scrutiny, the creatures and peoples that inhabit Mirrodin are themselves a beautiful alloy an amalgamation of organic flesh interwoven with metallic outgrowths to create resilient holes. Mirrodin is also unique, but not entirely novel, in its status as an artificially created plane. Its metaphysical bedrock was found in a decaying state of destruction centuries ago, and if not for the intervention of powerful hands, it would have been consumed in its entirety by entropy's voracious hunger. Instead, Mirrodin was molded, carefully crafted to precise specifications, built artificially of a grand design. Similar to the old plane of Phyrexia before its dissolution, Mirrodin wasn't born naturally from the forces of the multiverse. Despite and perhaps because of its resilience, Mirrodin has a tortured, twisted path, shaped time and again by outside forces. At one point known as Argentum, at another Mirrodin, and more recently New Phyrexia, the plane has donned myriad masks. To best understand this world, explore its varied ecosystems, and uncover its rich history, it's best to segment our journey into such epochs, for the change in name heralds gales and earthquakes that alter the very nature of the plane. We'll start centuries ago with the first shaping of Argentum. Let's dive in. The plane that would later become Mirrodin was born from coincidence, its vision created within the mind of Karn Silver Golem, a newly ascended planeswalker who stumbled upon a foundational skeleton of a plane that was derelict and desolate, while exploring the blind eternities and testing the limits of his newly acquired skill. What Karn saw was possibility. A blank canvas lay before his eyes that held untold masterpieces, a slab of clay from which he could shape the whims of his mind. In the aftermath of Phyrexian invasion, after much death and destruction, Karn yearned to create rather than demolish. The vision for Argentum flashed before him, and Karn set about crafting a plane around this desolate skeleton. He materialized the structure and substrate of his metallic world using immense, pre-mending powers. As a being himself born of artifice, the Silver Golem formed Argentum in his own image, a mathematically perfect world built of steel its endless horizons and cloudless skies sporadically broken by domineering metal towers. Beneath this outer shell, an internal sphere housed a massive orb of pure mana, the core of the plane that fueled it, stabilized it, and tethered it to the rest of the multiverse. Large struts and coils of interwoven beams connect the core to the surface and support the external world. With this grand creation given shape, Karn realized it remained eerily silent, devoid of life. The Silver Golem understood how violently unpredictable natural and sentient creatures could be, so to retain its lustrous innocence, Karn fashioned a generation of metal golems in his likeness, endowed them with the purpose of safeguarding his idyllic creation, and distributed them across the plane. The Ur Golems, like their progenitor, were industrious and tireless, 
roaming the surface to maintain Argentum's perfection. Karn, meanwhile, was filled with wonderlust, a burning desire within his heart to learn, teach, and explore limitless possibility in the blind eternities tore him from peaceful reverie on Argentum. Before he set off to unknown realms, he crafted another golem superior to the Ur golems in design and purpose, imbued with the powers of the Mirari artifact placed in its core, and instilled in it the role of steward over all Argentum in its master's stead. The golem Memnarch was born and the planeswalker ventured beyond the plane. But Karn had left something behind. A dark stain of glistening Phyrexian oil had dripped from the silver golem and over time would initiate a startling, corrupting transformation of both the plane and its steward. Twisted by the glistening oil that penetrates both mind and body, Memnarch terraforms Argentum to fulfill his own glorious vision, a world that supports life beyond that of the artificial silent Ur golems. The steward grows jealous of his master, and resentment boils into desire, a need to acquire a planeswalker spark. To harvest such a spark, he turns the plane into a massive experimental terrarium with the purpose of housing beings kidnapped from other worlds. The slow, methodical task of reshaping Argentum is shouldered by the Urgolums at Memnarch's behest. They terraform the plane's pristine surface, erect metal facsimiles of forest and field, mountain of rugged rock, fetid swamps of rusted metal, oceans of foaming quicksilver. The golem's task is aided by the strange substance mycosynth, which works at a microscopic level to transform metal into organic material and vice versa, altering the foundational composition of the plane. We can see this illustrated in cards like Mycosynth Golem and Mycosynth Lattice. It gains a particularly strong purchase within the plane's mana-rich core. As Argentum assumes a new shape and purpose, it's also given the name Mirrodin, bestowed by its warden Memnarch. With the Ur Golem's purpose fulfilled, Memnarch sees in them only potential opposition to his rule. Mirrodin's despotic creator systematically and brutally eradicates them. This epoch of transformation is cataloged in the flavor text of the Cycle of Tower cards. Tower of Fortunes reads, The Ur Golem etchings begin by celebrating Mirrodin's creator, a golem of almost limitless power. They end by cursing its protector, a being called Memnarch. While Tower of Champions states, The Urgolum runes tell of the transformation of Mirrodin's warden from silent guardian to merciless god, which hearkens to the slaughter of their kind. As his terrarium takes shape, Memnarch imports all manner of creatures to populate Mirrodin's variable ecosystems using soul traps that ensnare from other worlds. From his observatory of Panopticon within Mirrodin's core, the plane steward silently watches his experiment unfold. We see this in the art of Eyes of the Watcher. Memnarch's observation is supplemented through thousands of artifact creatures known as Mir, which act as the eyes, ears, and presence of their master, who gradually recedes behind the mists of mystery and isolation. We see the Mir created in the art of Genesis Chamber, whose flavor text reads, as the experimental population grows, so do the number of Mir. It's a perfect equilibrium. In its completed form, Mirrodin is divided into five large geographical regions, each uniquely tied to a particular color of mana, whose influence largely dictates the environs and inhabitants. Each region has within it a lacuna, a large hollow tunnel burrowed into the core of Mirrodin, and from which a respective ball of pure mana of similar color burst forth to claim its place among the firmament as a sun. Five such suns trace a course across the plain sky and impact the forms or abilities of creatures on the surface below, as seen in the mechanic sunburst. Each lacuna from which the suns emerged is rich with residual mana of their respective color. Mirrodin is a variegated plain despite its dominant artifice and metal. Each region is host to vibrant ecosystems where specific creatures and sentient races well adapted to the mana that shapes them, inhabit. Humans, the most malleable of races, are found in abundance across all regions. Their interaction with others determines the geopolitical landscape. We'll begin our tour of Mirrodin with the wide aligned region of the Razor Fields. Expansive plains of smoothly rolling hills are covered in densely packed thickets of tall, sharp metallic grasses, namesake of the razor fields. Though stunningly beautiful at a distance, 
The razor grasses bear edges and points sharp enough to flay muscle or metal alike, and are often used as a defense for this region's populations. We can see the dangerous serenity of the razor grasses on the art of several plains cards, and many beings such as Razorfield Rhino and Razor Golem have adapted to the lethal blades with thick hides of metal. The dominant race on the plains are the cat-like Marshal Leonin, who organize themselves into familial prides much akin to lions. From the ancient den of Tajnar, the ruling Ka issues decrees and arbitrates grievances. A deeply religious culture, the Leonin worship the white sun. Their clerics, called Abunas, are adept at both restoring metal and dismantling it, which we can see in the cards Altar's Light and Ritual of Reclamation. Fierce, Terran Mountain Knights, dubbed Sky Hunters, patrol the razor fields from above to safeguard the prides from external threats, equipped with the best weaponry forged by renowned smiths. The razor fields are also home to steadfast elephant-like Loxodon. Adopting an aura of stoic monasticism, Loxodon are wholly devoted to the moral strictures dictated in the codes of the modest truth. They're obstinate in belief and unyielding in battle, which makes them exceedingly recalcitrant. Inflexible to a fault, Loxodon are nevertheless the most stalwart of allies. Their clerical order roams the razor fields to dispense justice, offer alms, and listen to atonement of penitence. We see this on display in cards like Loxodon Mystic and Loxodon Anchorite, while the stalwart highlights their firm disposition in its flavor text. Long ago, the Orok attempted peace with the Loxodons, the Leonin attempted war, neither succeeded. Weaving through heavily worn footpaths that crisscross the fields are bands of nomadic humans called Ariok. The Ariok pride themselves in transience. They take only what is necessary, sustain themselves with scraps salvaged from their environment, and rarely remain in one location for long. Ariok elders are master steel shapers. They use white mana spells to weave formidable armaments with which to staunchly defend their way of life, which is illustrated in the card's true conviction and Steel Shaper's Gift. Ariok travel between Leonin prides and Loxodon bands, offering tools, plying their skills, and bartering for the wares necessary before continuing their endless wanderings. Deep in the heart of this region is the luminous white lacuna of the Cave of Light, steeped heavily in myth. It's a strong symbolic and religious location for the Razorfield's denizens, who worship and perform incantations. We see the White Lacuna on display in Beacon of Immortality and the worship of the Leonin in the card White Sun's Passage, whose flavor text reads, All over the razor fields, White Sun is celebrated. Even the followers of the rebel Jurian, far from the Cave of Light, bow their heads in reverence. The sharp grasses and shimmering plains of the razor field give way to looming spires of living metal that twist and branch as they reach toward the heavens, supporting a broad ecosystem on and beneath their canopy seen in Razor Verge Thicket. This dense forest of steel is aptly named the Tangle, Mirrodin's green-aligned region. Even on a plane of steely artifice so opposed to this color of mana, the natural fierce vigor of life manifests itself within the Tangle. Here, massive spiders and mantises silently stalk prey on unseen branches. The voracious pack hunters known as Fangren maraud in wild droves, and deep trenches are carved into the earth by plated worms whose length is measured not in distance, but time. Such natural forces and creatures have shaped the tangle into an awesome fountain of life that is yet dangerous, a place of beauty that demands respect. The Viridian Elves are a sophisticated, structured race that make their home in the tangle's sheltered boughs. Like the elves of other planes and perhaps retaining traces of their original world's cultures, Viridian elves are deeply attuned to mana ley lines. They revere the natural world, the cycle of life, and they abhor all deemed artificial blasphemy that exists only to mock the pure. On a plane like Mirrodin, with a foundation built on metal, steel, fabrication, synthesis, the Viridian have little to revere and much to destroy. We see their expertise on display in cards like Viridian Shaman and deconstruct. Tel Jalad, the tree of tales and oldest tree on the plain, is located deep within the forest. It's a holy site for the elves as well as the race of trolls that dwells within its hollow trunk. Etched with the history of Mirrodin, 
Teljalad is guarded by the trolls whose monastic and ascetic lives are spent chronicling histories, weaving tales of the plane for future generations. A small band of elves, chosen by the trolls and affecting both merit and skill, protect the tree with their lives, patrolling its borders to seek out threats. We see this in cards like Teljalad Chosen and Outriders. The green-aligned human druids of the Silvok also owe their survival to the bounteous tangle. While the elves seek to maintain the natural order through aggressive eradication, Silvok instead nourish growth. They foster life to spread green mana's ideals. This comes in the flavor text of Lifesmith, which reads, The Silvok see the artificer as a gardener, preparing the world for hardy growth. The Silvok are sojourners at heart, and to become an esteemed druid one must survive off the land, must outsmart the Tangle's dangers in a vision quest. One Silvok's quest ended abruptly in the card Alpha Tyrannix. In Nourish and Silvok Explore, we see how in tune the humans are with the Tangle. They are extensions of its will and can navigate its threats with relaxed clarity. In the heart of the forest lies the green lacuna known as the Radix, an unfathomably deep trench revered both by Viridian and Silvok. The location is depicted in the art of Hum of the Radix, and its importance in Viridian culture is detailed in its flavor text. The elves learned long ago that anything left here slowly vanishes. Now it's a sacred site where the dead are laid to rest and where unnatural magic is erased forever. Although the Radix is a place of vanishment, of ending and loss, it's also one of explosive growth due largely to surges of green mana. Its powerful force of nature can be seen in the art of the card, Beacon of Creation. At its fringes, the shadowed coolness of the tangle gives way to molten death files and volcanic rock steaming under the unabating rays of Mirrodin suns. This region of sulfurous fumes and rugged peaks marks the Oxida Ridges, a chain of contiguous mountain ranges heavily steeped in the fires of red mana. The Oxida chain is characterized by rusted landscapes of sharp, sloping irons heavily oxidized under the relentless environment. It's a land of chaos, of emotion, of heat and lightning that offers deep treasures to those willing to risk much. Golems and ogres plod the larger paths through winding canyons. Scrap beasts with strong stomachs melt down and ingest bountiful slag heaps for sustenance. The crimson skies are patrolled by implacable hellkites whose molten breath liquefies bone and brass alike. Oxida is unforgiving, but there are several races that have adapted to survive, becoming as hardy as the lands in which they dwell. Chief among these are the clumsy and comically inept goblin clans who tend forges, stoke furnaces, smith tools, mine precious minerals, wage war, and engage in myriad activities of varying stupidity that invariably shorten lifespans. Goblins organize themselves into clans of familial or like-minded individuals, the most notable of which is the Krark clan, so named after an eccentric and unusually intelligent goblin that sojourned into Mirrodin's core and preached his findings. The goblins of Mirrodin specialize in artifice. They engineer, excavate, empower and smelt machines or equipment. Their talent is on display in cards like Goblin Archaeologist and Granulate, whose flavor text reads, There aren't that many ways to destroy a solid steel weapon, but somehow the goblins keep finding new ones. While Krark Clan Engineer reads, well, I jammed the Wutsit into the Wackadoodle, but I think I broke the thingamajigger. Goblins are most densely gathered around the great furnace of Kuldatha, where they tend massive forges and worship their deity. In the sweltering center of this city-sized foundry resides the Red Lacuna, whose residual traces of red mana seep into the landscape and spawn burning hot elementals. The red-aligned human tribes of Volshok are in constant conflict with goblin clans and all else who enter their domains. Volshok are battle-hardened barbarians who submit themselves wholly to the chaotic frenzy of war. They revel in passionate emotions released in bloodletting. Second to battle for the Volshok is the forging of blades and armor with which to slay. Their creative energies burn like the hot coals of their smithies, and Volshok steel shapers are renowned the plane over for their talent, seen in the illustration of Forge Armor. War bands are supplemented by spark mages and sorcerers that harness built-up electromagnetism to unleash devastating bolts of lightning, a dangerous skill on a plane of metal. 
Sorcerers and Volshock Geomancers also command the raw, molten energies that seethe beneath the surface. They direct flows of magma to melt, they conjure elementals to scorch foes, and they tap into rich mana reserves to fuel other spells. Their skill is highlighted in the art of the card Mana Geyser, whose flavor text reads, The Quicksilver Sea hissed and bubbled at the indignity. The Volshock Shaman just smiled. Volshock's struggle, like all within Oxida, to survive in a hellish landscape replete with dangers both natural and unnatural. At its borders, the explosive energies of Oxida are overtaken by an eerie stagnant silence that weighs heavily on all who venture into the fetid swap plans of the black-aligned Mephidros, consuming them in wispy, insidious tendrils. This region of moors and mires is the haven of blight, death, greed, pestilence, symbolic of black mana. Horrors lurk, zombie-like Nim are drawn to the sweet nectar of life. Chittering artifacts and insects vigorously feed on abundant sources of rot and detritus, all of which is blanketed by swirling mists of toxic fumes called necrogen. Necrogen's a mysterious, pervasive gas that corrodes both mind and flesh, eats memory, and transforms those who linger into the undead of Mirrodin, called Nim. The gas is illustrated in cards like Necrogen Mists and Consume Spirit, whose text reads, Mephidros changes all who dwell there, taking their lives and adding them to its own. What Necrogen wraps its mists around is slowly killed and altered into a member of endless ranks of Nim. The Nim are the dominant race in a region where all that is abundant is death and decay. Their existence is pain, as they struggle desperately to regain lost selves. They spread their pain to others, drawn to the living by warm pulses of life. Nim devour without temperance, they're mindless, relentless zombies that consume metal as readily as flesh. The lich and self-stylized Lord of the Vault Geth controls ranks of Nim, directing their hunger to fulfill his vile machinations. His ambition is highlighted in the flavor text of Barter and Blood. In the game of conquest, who cares about the pawns if the king yet reigns? In a brutal fight for survival amongst the swirling death of the Dross are the human Moriok tribes. Moriok are pragmatic and brutish. They eke out a sad and self-serving existence as scavengers, meticulously picking choice bits out from the rotting detritus. We see them on display in the card Moriok Rigor, whose flavor text reads, the Moriok scavenge for weapons, for armor, for food and ultimately for their souls. Moriok are initially drawn to this forsaken swamp by its secrets and the promises of lost treasures. Opportunists set out to uncover big scores, but are slowly corrupted by necrogen and lose themselves in the opaque mists. The flavor text of Flesh Grafter highlights its effect on Moriok. Necrogen inflames certain emotional centers in the Moriok's brains, hate, aggression, and especially greed. Many of these humans swear oaths of fealty to the dangerous Lich Lord Geth. Those who don't keep a modest distance from his seat of power in ish -Saw, the Vault of Whispers. ish -Saw is steeped in black mana. It's a source of necrogen mists that billow from its peak, and deep within is housed the Black Lacuna. Moriok necromancers practice dark arts under their master's cruel eye. Above soar skeletal dragons and sinister dross vampires. The hissing miasma of Mephidros disperses against relentless gales and breaking waves of the Quicksilver Sea, Mirrodin's blue-aligned region. As its name suggests, this maritime body is filled with a malleable liquid metal rather than water, and true to its name, the sea's reaches are fickle as Quicksilver. Its uncharted depths are populated with variegated species of serpent, leviathan, octopus, and benthic dwellers, while peculiar schools of flying fish and manta rays flit along the powerful jet streams above. Enormous insectoid striders move about the water surface, maintaining their position atop with deft skill. As one ventures from the remote wilds of the Quicksilver, signs of civilized settlement appear. The vast floating fortress of Lumengrid dominates the horizon, a bastion of knowledge and progress. Poised atop massive metal stilts rising from the waters, Lumengrid is haven to the enlightened race of blue-skinned and cold-hearted Vidalkin, who care little for sympathetic hospitality. They spend all waking hours engrossed in preservation of information, in illumination of the mind, 
It's the most valuable commodity and the currency of choice, which we hear in the flavor text of Lumen Grid Auger. Information pumps like blood through Vidalkin society. Vidalkin are masters of artifice and mental magic. As cold as the metal they shape, the Vidalkin ponder the deepest mysteries of Mirrodin above all else, seen in Thoughtcast and Vidalkin Archmage. In Lumen Grid's walkways is situated the Knowledge Pool, the blue lacuna of Mirrodin, in whose liquid luminance the answer to all questions flows. We see it illustrated in Beacon of Tomorrows and the eponymous Knowledge Pool. Mirrodin's blue lacuna is a source of arcane wisdom presided over by the Synod, a council of the highest ranking artificers, researchers, and wizards among the Vidalkin, who direct their endeavors and arbitrate research grants. But the knowledge of the pool doesn't flow freely. As the flavor text of Grid Monitor suggests, the Vidalkin are highly protective of their insights and guard Lumen Grid with focused vigilance. It reads, the Vidalkin protect the knowledge pool at any cost. They employ all manner of traps, security measures, and artifacts, thus ensuring their most cherished knowledge isn't uncovered by prying eyes. Perhaps the most infamous defenders are legions of hoverguard drones that silently patrol the skies in search of trespassers or in response to threats. We see this in the art of hoverguard sweepers, and their lethal efficiency is recounted in the flavor text of advanced hoverguard. They're like their Verdalkin masters, untouchable, aloof, and omnipresent. Along the Quicksilver shoreline, tinfoil shantytowns bob with the ebb of the tide. These makeshift settlements are erected by the blue-aligned human faction of Nurok. The Nurok are slim and pale, reflective of their subjugated inferiority in light of the technologically and intellectually advanced Vidalkin. Like Vidalkin, these humans cherish knowledge above all else and pursue esoteric lives to study deep arcana. They are master wizards, artificers, couriers, and spies. Nurok are notorious for skill in espionage and infiltration, as seen in a choir. They don stealth suits and shroud themselves in magic to obscure, while their hallmark multiplex goggles allow Nurok to scan environments for minute details. Nurok are supplicants of Vidalkin overlords who harass settlements and enslave many without resistance. Though seen as inferior, Nurok are employed as mercenaries to bolster Lumen Grid's defenses as seen in the Sentinel and as couriers, holders of vital information for Vidalkin who mistrust their own kind. The Quicksilver Sea is a dangerous, ever-shifting expanse that holds Mirrodin's deepest truths for those brave enough to question. Beyond the sea, beyond Mephidros' toxic fumes and the crimson defiles of Oxida, there is an endless vista of hexplate steel, blank and polished, to reflect the rays of Mirrodin's suns. This vast swath of emptiness is known as the Glimmer Void, a canvas of untapped potential that extends to the horizon in all directions. The aura of potential this region evokes is captured in the flavor text of the card that bears its name, reading, an empty canvas holds infinite possibilities. The largely unexplored Glimmer Void interacts strangely with magic, sending spells ricocheting off its reflective surface and amplifying effects in bizarre patterns. A heavy silence thickens the atmosphere of this barren desert, whose horizon is broken up only by a handful of large, mysterious spires, little understood by the Mirans. These structures are the work of the lost race of Urgolums and imbued with their arcane power. Etched onto the tower's edifices are the Protean history of Argentum, as well as the Urgolums' plight and eventual defeat at the hands of treacherous Memnarch. The Urgolums' strength is on display in the activated abilities of each of these towers, and their downfall immortalized in the flavor text of Tower of Murmurs. Etched on its surface are warnings from a long-lost race of Urgolums pushed to the brink of extinction. Deep beneath Mirrodin's surface and obscured by myth lies the plane's core, bastion of the mad steward Memnarch who pulls on puppet strings from his fortress of Panopticon, a silent and devious observer. Mirrodin's core is hollow and largely devoid of life, a silent expanse reminiscent of the glimmer void above whose repetitive scenery is broken only by towers of dark steel, or lattices of mycosynth. From the dark steel eye of Panopticon, Memnarch indulges in the mind-expanding Blinkmoth serum that extends his consciousness as he orchestrates grand designs for the surface above. We see this in the art of the card Second Sight. 
Murr underlings toil endlessly on the surface to relay information about his experiments, and in the core they harness powerful surges of mana to fuel machines of war, as depicted in the art of Core Tapper, whose flavor text reads, It converts the faintest surges of power from Mirrodin's core into usable energy, providing endless power for Memnarch's creations on the surface. But Memnarch's impregnable observatory holds a dark secret and grim reality. As seen in the art of Mirrodin's core, this region has been significantly shaped by Mycosynth and the underlying glistening oil of Phyrexia, which has worked slowly but effectively over decades, laying the groundwork for infection of the plane and rise of a new Phyrexia. At the end of the original Mirrodin block, Memnarch was defeated, his soul traps destroyed, and the plane left in tatters from years of interminable wars and the sudden disappearance of thousands, known as the Vanishing, as those beings brought from other worlds by traps were returned to their home planes. Despite its sad state, Mirrodin rejoiced in the overthrow of its crazed warden and the freedom hard fought from his predations. But the reverie wouldn't last and Memnarch pales in comparison to what follows. The glistening oil that had silently worked in the background, changing and twisting Mirrodin, is finally prepared to emerge from the shadows and launch a dangerous, infectious strike against the plane as it consumes all in its progress towards Phyrexian completion. The Scars of Mirrodin Block catalogs the Mirrodin's recovery of the plane, their attempt to resume normal lives in wake of Memnarch's defeat, and the rapid proliferation of the Phyrexian contagion. At first, the inhabitants thought little of the strange black oil seeping into the land. But soon, whole regions were filled with blight, individuals became afflicted with gangrenous ailments, and hearts were darkened by promises of power. The spread of the oil is on display in the art of the card's steady progress, an inexorable tide. The contagion further weakened populations already in decline from the vanishing. And then, without forewarning or alarm, new Phyrexia burst from the core of Mirrodin. Its endless swarm crawled across the surface and pulled Mirrodin into bloody conflict as Phyrexia sought to invade the plain from within. Following invasion and the unstoppable spread of the corrupting oil, all of Mirrodin finds itself in a desperate fight for survival against Phyrexia's nightmarish horrors pouring forth from the plain's underbelly. Besieged on all sides and tarnished from within, the Mirrodin's struggle is noble but hopeless. The plain and its inhabitants succumb to the poisoned blessings of perfection espoused by Phyrexia's leading praetors. The Scars of Mirrodin Block highlights the fight against plague as ill-prepared Mirrins turn on another and descend into corrupted madness as they are swept by the tide of Phyrexia. With their victory achieved, Mirrodin is lost, a massive casualty of the war whose memory will live on only in the minds of planeswalkers like Elspeth Turil. Every shred of Mirrodin, every last vestige of its history is torn apart, digested, and repurposed to realize new Phyrexia's illustrious vision, the plane itself losing its old name and assuming Phyrexia's sinister mantle. Mirrodin's regions, its cultures and peoples, are transformed and indoctrinated to align with the Praetor's grand designs. New Phyrexia immediately undertakes a terraforming endeavor on a plane-wide scale. The five surface regions of Mirrodin are no longer, instead replaced by nine nested spheres, which harkens to the structure and memory of old Phyrexia, domain of Yagmoth, father of machines, before its ultimate destruction centuries prior. Each of New Phyrexia's spheres is unique in environment and purpose, becoming smaller in size, but greater in significance as one journeys towards the plane's twisted heart. They are displayed in their entirety in this illustration. The glorious facade dominates Phyrexia's surface. A testament to their victory over Mirrodin, their freedom from memories of the past, the facade is built atop the plane's old surface and glorifies the Praetor's achievements in glistening statues and porcelain busts. A layer built solely for Phyrexian vanity and to remind those under their heel to whom they owe subservience. Beneath the foundation of the facade's temples and monuments lies the Myrex, a blasted wasteland that marks the remnants of Mirrodin. Ravaged by war and exploited by Phyrexia to rebuild the plain, the Myrex is largely denuded of resources. It's a barren, dark land where only the ghosts and memories of fallen Mirren linger in shadow. The Furnace Lair is directly under the Mirex. This sphere of molten steel, smoldering sparks and choking fumes is aligned with red mana and under stewardship of Urabrask the Hidden. 
Massive forges craft titan engines of devastation. Foundries smelt ores into new arms and armaments, tended by wizards, smiths, and priests. The furnace is a haven of passionate ingenuity in a world largely stagnant in thought, bloated with Phyrexian indoctrination. Creativity flows with the red mana that fuels it, and although Elish Norn technically rules as mother of machines, her control over the hidden furnace is barely tenable. Much of its happenings are unknown to outsiders. Beneath the furnace's sweltering heat lies a realm of blossoming metallic greenery, suffused with vigorous growth whose dense thicket obscures all manner of monsters. The Hunter's Maze is the green alliance feared of labyrinthine artificial forests originally belonging to Meriden's Tangle that were transplanted at the behest of Vorinclex's Voice of Hunger. The Praetor of Predation embodies survival of the fittest and his hunting grounds within the maze harbor the most aggressive, fearsome, and domineering Phyrexians. Weakness isn't allowed purchase in this fear, it's cold through subjugation. Fighting allows the strong to thrive through brute strength, their claims backed by show of force when necessary. Despite existing on a world of metal and revering machines, Vornklex's faction embraces the naturalism found in green mana and favors organic over artificial, which we can see in the flavor text of Creeping Corrosion. In opposition to blue mana, the beings within this sphere seek evolution through wild means. Sitting beneath the maze are endless vats, breeding pools, splicing stations, and experimental laboratories characteristic of the surgical bays, Phyrexia's blue-aligned fifth sphere. Havens of knowledge and structures of artificial perfection rise above an endless ocean of quicksilver mixed with glistening oil. Here, wizards of experimentation conduct subversive and blasphemous trials under the all-knowing eye of the progress engine's praetor, Jin Gitaxius. The Gitaxians value information above all else. They tout intellectual superiority and are obsessed with the addictive pursuit of knowledge. They are masters of artifice and biorecombination. Gitaxians spawn synthetic abominations of metal and flesh to promote new Phyrexia. Cards like Vivisection and Xenograft highlight the physical brutality of the progress engine. But minds are equally rent and remade in pursuit of perfection as seen in psychic surgery. Jin Gitaxius views his position as the ultimate seat which stokes paranoia against the other praetors. He dispatches sleepers and spies to track his rivals, gleaning information on strengths, but more importantly, weaknesses. Stinking pools of rancid filth mark entrance into the dross pits, the black aligned six sphere. It's a grim place constantly wrapped in toxic necrogen mists. Here, machines of pestilence are created, and only the brazenly ambitious survive. Obliterators, demons, zombies, and ghouls are ruled through ever-shifting allegiances towards the Seven Steel Thanes. Childred, the black-aligned praetor of secrets and desires, holds precariously onto her position as leader of the Thanes and ruler of this sphere. But her humiliating defeat and pledge of fealty to Elish Norn has laid bare a weakening grip as the remaining Thanes constantly probe for an opportunity to usurp her. Death and pain are in large supply in the dross pits, a bubbling cauldron seething with self-serving machinations. Deep in the heart of New Phyrexia sits the impregnable, white-aligned sphere of the fair basilica from which Elish Norn rules all the plain as the mother of machines. The Grand Cenobite sits atop her throne administering the machine orthodoxy which preaches infectious propaganda and extols unity through blessed perfection. A whitewashed porcelain realm, pristine and sanitized, is marked by large statues immortalizing Norn where her supplicants bend knees to worship. The throne room, adorned with gaudy monuments, is where Norn schemes against the other praetors. Although she rules in name, her superiority is constantly challenged and strength called into question. It's here that Norn also oversees the Phyrexian plot to invade other planes in the multiverse. The fair basilica echoes with sermons that ingrain subservience and resignation to the cause. Priests, Clerics and artificers of the orthodoxy are among the most zealous Phyrexians and will sacrifice much to achieve their goals. Through isolation, torture, indoctrination, they convert others to the orthodoxy. The remaining layers are the beating heart of new Phyrexia, accessible only with Elish Norn's blessing. The Mycosynth Gardens are the remnants of old Mirrodin's core. Lattices and columns of the substance have grown vigorously wild, left untended and unchecked. The Mycosynth's encroachment is on display in the art of encroaching Mycosynth, and we see the extent of its virulent propagation in the Mycosynth Gardens. 
This sphere acts as substrate and foundational cocoon for the final sphere that houses the seed core, an incubation chamber for new Phyrexia's ultimate invasion weapon, Realmbreaker. Tendrils of this adolescent world tree, stolen from the plain of Kaldheim, can be seen wrapping around the Mycosynth Gardens. When fully mature, Realmbreaker will shatter the barriers of the blind eternities and allow transit from one plane to another. This will turn Phyrexia's dream into reality and allow both them and the glistening oil to extend beyond their world and corrupt countless planes. As such, it's Phyrexia's most precious holding and protected from attack by all nine spheres within which Realmbreaker is enclosed. Argentum, Mirrodin, New Phyrexia different names assigned to an artificial plane and indicative of the tempestuous history it has endured. Once a realm of cold perfection, it took on a fiery life of its own and adapted with awe-inspiring brilliance, only to succumb to a sickness long instilled and brought once more toward a notion of perfection. But is Phyrexia the ultimate fate of a world that has endured so much? Will it be reclaimed by partisans fighting to restore Mirrodin, or corrupted beyond redemption Will it be obliterated by a group of planeswalkers intent on thwarting Phyrexia? Only time will tell. Thanks so much for watching and listening to the Plane of Mirrodin and New Phyrexia Explained. Now I want to hear from you. Let me know your thoughts on Mirrodin, on New Phyrexia and Argentum, as well as suggestions for future videos in the comments below. And if you're a fan of lore and storytelling, consider subscribing to the channel or checking out the podcast where content is uploaded frequently. Again, a huge shout out to all of my Patreon supporters who make all of this possible. I couldn't do it without their spectacular patronage. If you're interested in becoming a lore luminary for access to me, a great community, and early video drops, check out the link below or head to patreon.com slash to learn more. Until next time, go forth and explore the lore. <laughs>